I, Rob Geyer, and I am a cybersecurity attorney with a law firm we call Benevolent LLP. So we're on social security compliance, uh, law hacking, and is all many people with their cybersecurity incidents. I'm also the coordinator for the Hacking Policy Council, which is a group of companies that works on happy policy, uh, older building that using bug values and security research. This is hacking AI. It's not just for security anymore. When we're talking about hacking AI, we're not talking about it in the sense of malicious criminals that are seeking to cause harm. We're also talking about hacking AI for ethical reasons, right? To test it in order to find things that we can then fix so that the bad guys can be exploited later. And the one, you know, this is a lightning talk, so, you know, in a short amount of time that I have, the one idea that I want to get across is that for the non-security parts of AI testing, we need legal clarity and legal protections. I'll tell you what I mean. So, why now? I mean, I do see there is a great deal of adoption of AI across the public and by its sector, um, but you're also already seeing malicious criminals attempting to hack AI for non security and security reasons. We're seeing uh, companies uh, already testing AI for security and non security breaches. Um, emerging regulation and seniors cover both security of AI, but also non security considerations. A lot of that is slowing from executive order of Lump Room Zero, uh, which requires NIST to come up with guidelines on the center hop breath team maps. So, when we say hacking, again, drawing a distinction between uh, criminal action and then tapping for, like, for putting habit for testing, it goes by several names, it's not really a consensus yet, but think of it as testing AI. Uh, Red D is a type of it, right? So, where it's an adversarial test, or you're putting yourself in the shoes of an attacker and pretending to attack so you can apply the laws of vulnerabilities and correct them. Another is bug bounties or bias bounties. Uh, bias bounties are a little bit newer, where we are paying individuals to find, again, not security vulnerabilities, but things like bias, and giving them a little work for that. So, when we're doing it, there's two different buckets that could be the result of it. The one security matter at LDs. Right, but pretty well familiar with those things. But the other, because it is artificial intelligence, and artificial intelligence covers a lot of different concerns, even with things like bias, uh, racial and gender discrimination, toxic or ease of content, or other hard plot books like finding synthetic child sexual abuse and health. For the legal side of it, or, uh, sorry, the security side of this, the, the security bite. Uh, we actually presently, over the course of several years, have some pretty well-developed uh, secure legal protections for that activity. So companies that want to share amongst themselves information about vulnerabilities or exploits or cybersecurity threats, they have a fair amount of uh, leeway to do that, an exemption from liability. They're exempt from things like antitrust, they're exempt from things like uh, certain privacy laws. This was under the uh, CISA 15 law. Um, Companies increasingly have coordinated vulnerability disclosure policies where they can intake vulnerability information so that they can know about it and then fix it from people who are not solicited to provide that. Right? So uh, every federal agency right now has a coordinated vulnerability disclosure policy. And then for individuals who are conducting that testing by themselves, we have legal protections for them under our main anti-hacking laws. So that includes the Computer Fraud and Abuse Acts and Section 1201 of the digital world of cadre as. But on the known security side of the house, there is a big gap in those legal protections. If you look at the statutes, they all talk about security and safety. They don't talk about these other concerns that we have identified as dual crucial for AI deployment, bias, discrimination, toxic and use of content and so forth. So uh, concurrently, companies don't have the same protection as they wanted to as a crew share amongst themselves information related to, say, a novel attack method that is producing synthetic child sexual abuse material. Um, companies, although they have coordinated security vulnerability disclosure policies, do not yet, as a rule, have a coordinated algorithmic flaw disclosure policy, where if you want to submit an algorithmic disclosure or algorithmic flaw to date, then you have the same protections as it would for submitting security vulnerability. And importantly, the individual start conducting research, like testing, like what is eating AI by themselves, don't have the same protections 
if they if they're doing if they're doing that testing for non-security purposes, as if they were doing it to find security vulnerabilities. So if I'm testing your AI deployment to find bias, you know, gender discrimination, again, not protected the way that it would be if I'm finding this vulnerability. So this leads to policy priorities. I think that are I think going to quickly come to the fore as our regulations become more specific. Um, the overarching issue, of course, of this more trust for the AI fair the AI. But we recognize that uh, non-security issues are cr critical to that about where the intranet deployment. Uh, so just like over the past 10 years or so, we've recognized that security reporting, information sharing is good for the ecosystem, which is why we've provided it with those legal protections. We need to recognize the same thing is necessary for the non-security side of the house when it comes to AI. And that includes seeing AI operators, similar protections to share threats, uh, attack techniques and algorithmic flaw vulnerabilities for non-security problems. Uh, not criminalizing ethical AI hackers, right? So individuals who are testing in AI for non-security reasons. There's currently a petition right now before the Copyright Office to do this under Section 1201, the uh, And lastly, clarifying security versus non-security legal obligations. Uh, nomenclature ends up being important to this in this realm here. A lot of people refer to these things just kind of in general as vulnerability, but we have a lot of laws right now that place legal obligations on security vulnerabilities. They're not really intended to sweep in non-security flaws. So, priorities is worth. My battle is very low. Oh no! Well, the good news is I only had one more slide, and it said thank you. <laughs> so, thank you. <laughs>